I got to tell you, one of the things, again, about this 30 Days of Taker series is allowing me to go back and think about days gone by and things that have been deep, deep, deep in the memory banks. It feels like almost to the point where you don't even recall them and seeing them kind of come to life. And as you're watching some of these old shows, you're sitting there saying, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, God, yeah, that's right. Damn, I do remember that. What the hell were they thinking there? God, that was freaking awesome. Like, going back and watching some of these old shows certainly gives me that feeling. And as part of the 30 Days of Taker video series tying into the video that I did uh, for the 18th installment, talking about why I hated American Badass Taker, only seemed to make logical sense that I would sit there and do a video today uh, reviewing Judgment Day 2000, where Human Taker made his debut slash return. <sighs> Plenty on that when we get to that point in time. But man, going back and watching this show, Judgment Day 2000, this show kicks ass. You had characters, you had stories, you had matches that were incredibly well pieced together, you had matches that told stories, you had workers with tremendous chemistry, you had performers that actually had cool things that were really over, there was craziness and spontaneity and, you know, multi-layers to these things, like, just fantastic to go back and watch a show like this. And, you know, it is a clear-cut reminder why if you go around the country now and you talk to people about the WWF or you talk about wrestling, you'll have, you could literally find millions of people, and this is not overestimation, you could literally find millions of people that will sit there and say, oh, yeah, I used to watch when Austin and The Rock were there. And you go back to a show like this and you absolutely understand why. When you think about WWF in 2000, what's crazy about it is Austin, for all intents and purposes, wasn't there. He was out with the neck problems. This was the year of The Rock and Triple H. And you know, I know as much as the company over the years tried to hype up the Austin and Rock feud, and they had tremendous chemistry together, and they were absolutely great playing off of each other. But damn... The Triple H rock rivalry runs circles around that because they had a great rivalry in the mid card and then they had a great rivalry at the top of the card that landed, lasted for an extended period of time. Like, if you're going to ask me which rivalry of the rocks I would prefer to watch from beginning to end and watch its arc and watch its development, it is him and Triple H all freaking day long. No insult to Austin, but that's just the reality of it. I got to believe I'm not the only one. But man, like, even the opening match on this show, the first thing you get, even before that, excuse me, before you even get to the first match, it's Vince backstage with all the DX and everybody, and they're talking, they're touching on the different things for the night, and they're sending the Stooge Wisco to go off and get coffee, but he's the hardcore champion, so it's 24-7 rules, so it's a running theme throughout the night that... He's spooked and he's scared because of the way that he won the hardcore title for Crash Holly. He creeped in on him when he was sleeping. Fantastic. Just magnificent. Stooge Jerry Briscoe fucking rock. Um, it was cool to get an old flashback to see freaking uh, Crash Holly again, I gotta tell you. Uh, but then you actually get to this opening match, and you got Kurt Angle taking the mic. Basically talking about how he's now a teenage heartthrob because he's aligned with Edge and Christian and advocating the girls practice abstinence and their three eyes, intensity, integrity, and intelligence. Like, how could you ever forget that? Like, early stage career Kurt Angle was fantastic. The incidental, totally intentional parody American hero heel. Just magnificent. And then Edge and Christian, back in their younger days, for the benefit of those with flash photography. And they're going to reveal a new pose. You're there in Louisville, Kentucky. And Christian said Louisville. <laughs> You're in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> what was it, the jug bad? <laughs> it has had the tea. <laughs> Just fantastic. And all of that is even before the opponents have come out. And it's Rikishi and too cool. So you got Kurt Angle doing Magnificence. Edge and Christian doing, you know, they're reeking of awesomeness. And then you get to the match. And my God, 
great chemistry between these teams, great characters on both sides, fantastic match construction. Like, you go back and you, you just think about how awesome the pairing of Rikishi and Too Cool was. Like, all of them had something big. Scotty Too Hottie had the worm. And that thing was over big time. Brian Christopher would go flying off the top rope and put the goggles down. That was over as hell. But nothing could be as over as when somebody was in the corner and you heard that ass drop and Rikishi caught wind of it. You know he was about to back that thing up and he was about to hit somebody with a stink face. God, this is so much fun. Like, if you're a modern fan and you're into the matches and the moves because you've been over meltzer you'll hate this. Because you're a part of the problem with wrestling today. You got away from what made it really awesome. Go back and watch this match. Listen to the crowd and how engaged they were in basically everything that happened. How engaged and invested they were in the freaking characters. And these guys didn't have to go out there and kill themselves. They didn't have to go do a bunch of incredibly risky things. It was a relatively basic six-man tag wrestling match with characters that people cared about. Great in-ring chemistry. Things matched out so well. You even had Teddy Long as the freaking ref here, my God sakes. This was a fantastic opener. And then you go to the European Championship, and God, ain't that a blast from the past, seeing Latino Heat Eddie Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero with his main squeeze, China. God, that was so much fun back in the day. And this feud between the three radicals, Perry Saturn and Dean Malenko and Eddie, Wrestling over the European Championship. Dean also coming in as the light heavyweight champion. And I'll say this. Dean Malenko used to bore the brakes off of me, but I at least understood Dean Malenko. Like I could get. He was butt down. He was serious. You know, very good technical wrestler. You know, I got that. I never got Perry Saturn. Like he had the one eye going this way, the one eye going that way. You smack him in, you knock him straight. Um, I never got him at all. I, it was it was always weird to me. And he always felt like he was a square peg in a round hole when he came to WWF. Maybe feels like one of those guys that should have stayed in either ECW or WCW. Um, but the, the only thing about this match was the crowd was clearly behind China and Eddie. They loved Eddie and they absolutely adored China. Who could blame him? Um, you know, there's the old cheating gimmick. <laughs> She's got the roses, but there's a lead pipe in there. But this match was not as good as I thought it was going to be. Now, to be fair, it's the first time I've watched this show in 20-plus years. So that's a long time since I've watched this show from beginning to end. For some reason, I thought this European Championship match, when I see Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero, admittedly, I get pretty excited. It was a little slow. It was a little choppy. Like, it didn't work. It was, oh, it was just okay. It's more about going back and seeing Eddie Guerrero in China than it is anything else, honestly. The no DQ match between Big Show and Shane McMahon, and I still get thrown off going back this far in time. And when you hear the no chance in hell theme, and thinking that that was originally associated with Shane, not Vince. Like, that's always weird to go back this far in the past and have to be reminded of that. And it was really weird here, too, them to emphasizing, you know, the fact that um, Vince is the father figure. He is the king of the jungle, but here is the young lion Simba, and it's Shane McMahon. I mean, it was kind of weird to hear them referencing Shane as Simba multiple times on the show. But what was really weird is having to go back and revisit, like, the 2000 run of Big Show, which was, especially early on, not good. Like, it was it was not great. Like, this is where they were kind of getting dopey with him. This is where they were kind of doing stupid things with him. The Shane McMahon rivalry certainly helped. This match, no DQ match, you know, obviously there's going to be all types of interference from Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan and everybody else. But this thing really worked. It, it was fun. I'll say that. It was a fun match. It, it absolutely was. <laughs> Shane coming out with the shirt, big nasty bastard. <laughs> Which way did he go? Which way did he go? <laughs> you know, for the for the fans now that got annoyed with seeing Shane McMahon on the TV all the time, there's also those fans of my generation that I remember going back and seeing, you know, just how cool Shane McMahon was as a character. He wasn't a megastar, but man, you know, when it came to some of these matches, you put him in these spots, 
he could have some really good rivalries, some really good stories, and I think this personally was another one. Uh, Intercontinental title match was next. It was a submission match of Chris Jericho uh, versus an invisible man. And, and tremendous effort here by Chris Jericho, you know, selling for somebody that you can't see or feel or hear, uh, working with somebody that doesn't exist. You know, you're not working with little Jimmy. You're working with somebody that does not exist in the WWE, WWF world, in the WWE universe anymore. Um, very, very good submission match. It's kind of weird when you look back at this show that your main event was going to be a one-hour Iron Man match, but you had a submission match, a no-DQ match. A little bit later on, after this IC match, you had a tag team tables match. Like, there were a lot of gimmicks here, but in this time in 2000, it worked. It absolutely worked. And I think part of the reason it worked is most all of these matches had some type of interesting, compelling story heading into it. You had interesting, compelling characters that actually knew how the hell to tell stories. That's what it comes down to. That's what wrestling is supposed to be. That's what wrestling is supposed to be all about. And that's why a significantly larger amount of people watch wrestling back then than do now. It has nothing to do with cord cutting or any other lousy-ass excuses that anybody gives. It's because we used to give a crap about what we saw. It's because the WWF used to give a crap about what they did. Don't anymore, for the most part. So we don't care, for the most part. Um... But really, really good match for Chris Jericho with an invisible man. The tag team tables match. Uh, <laughs> Bubba, who's going to get the wood tonight? I got to ask y'all, going back in time like this, DX versus the Dudley Boys, how many of you would have laid wood to Tory? It's a judgment-free zone. 20 years later, you know, as JR said, her ample breasts. <laughs> how many of y'all would have laid wood to Tory? I'm just, I'm just asking. Uh, cool match here. Like how all of this was done. And, you know, it was a tables match, but Dudley Boys ended up letting DX go over here. So pretty well done by them. But at this point in time, you're just all hyped up for the main event, which was going to be the WWF title, Iron Man match, 60 minutes, Shawn Michaels, special guest referee. Where is Allegiance is going to lie? Where, where is, what is he going to do? It's Triple H, it's The Rock, who's the champion walking into this show. And I know a lot of people look at the Iron Man match between Brett and Sean at WrestleMania 12 and hold it in high esteem and talk about how great it is. And, you know, for me, it's a pretty good match. I can agree with those that think it was kind of long and boring and a little bit on the overrated side. I could also certainly kind of understand that and... Now, especially looking back, kind of agree with it. From a historical lens, a historical standpoint, that Iron Man match will always be the most memorable, probably, in WWE history. But if you want to watch an Iron Man match that has so much more going for it, and it has carries so much more pure entertainment value, and has a lot more that actually happens that can rivet, rivet you and you know really grab your attention... This one is the one you want to go watch. This second Iron Man match in company history, Triple H versus The Rock. This match, to me, 60 minutes, it ain't no freaking overtime. They did so much here. Fuck WrestleMania 12. Just everything about this was like a masterclass on how to do this type of match. Like the pacing was outstanding. The decisions of who they had get pinfalls, how they had them get pinfalls, when they had him get pinfalls, some of the little mini things that they did within it were fantastic. You know, I would also say it was absolutely a master class in commentary for professional wrestling with peak JR and peak Jerry Lawler. Like the way these two were able to tell the story and keep interest going for an hour is just truly incredible. Our commentary now on professional wrestling has trouble doing that for a 10 or 15 minute match, let alone a 25 or 30 minute match, let alone the story that these two guys were able to go out and tell for a 60 minute match. And even the way they built this up to build drama, and it wasn't like you always trade in one fall for one fall or one fall for one fall. Like when you have Triple H uses a chair on the rock, 
gets a disqualification, evens it up, then immediately Triple H gets his feet up on the top rope, pins the rock, Shawn Michaels doesn't see it, he gets a one-up lead, and then a couple minutes later he hooks in his sleeper because now he's done some damage to the rock, all stemming from that chair shot. Now Triple H is up two, and you spend the last 10 minutes talking about is Rock going to be able to make up the gap because all he's got to do is tie here. All he's got to do is tie because he's the champion walking in. And the whole drama playing out as The Rock eventually gets to that point, it's just incredible. And just as you think, you know, that's it, then all of a sudden when Vince comes out and Steph comes out and everybody comes out, like, it starts to be pandemonium and chaos, and eventually Shawn Michaels takes the ref, ref bump, and then Rock's getting beaten up pretty good. And then, of course, you get the whole Titan Tron, and he's here, and here comes the returning Undertaker, but in human form, sitting there and barreling down the ramp in his freaking motorcycle. And the crowd was just absolutely electric. To throw something like this out there for those fans after sitting through almost an hour of that match where they have plenty of twisted turns in it all as it was, like, just absolutely outstanding booking from this company at that time. You know, and having The Undertaker come out at the time that the match is tied, it's right at the end, so Taker is taking names and kicking ass and cleaning house, but then you get to the very, very end, and, you know, as he's getting ready... Stephanie comes up from behind him, and then she tries to muss him up, and then Taker turns around and has got his grips on her. Then Hunter is going to come in there, and now all of a sudden Taker is going to lash out at Triple H. Eventually he gets ready to give him a tombstone pile driver. Shawn Michaels is now up looking, and Taker hits him with the tombstone pile driver. And the drama that plays out as Shawn Michaels goes and makes the call, and they make the announcement that... There's been a disqualification, and the winner, as a result of disqualification, and new World Wrestling Federation Champion, Triple H! And oh my god, all the different things in pieces that you had going on here. The heat between Rock and Triple H. Taker now coming into the fold, which also incorporates Kane and... Now, it was the Shawn Michaels piece of whose side is he on? Is he actually going to call this fair and down the middle? Like, just absolutely fantastic. When you go back and watch this match, like, the thing that really stands out is when this happens, like, you really can get a sense of the gravity of just how truly over The Rock was in 2000 with the people. There ain't no split crowd shit. It is The Rock is the freaking rock, and he is the damn man. And when Triple H is being carried out by Shane and by freaking Vince down up the ramp with the title, the fans are pelting the ring with shit. They're pelting Vince and Hunter with shit. Like, that is wrestling. Now, obviously, you can't do that now because everybody's become wussified. And everybody's like, well, you can't really do that. Like, this was back in the day, like, wrestling fed off of that and loved it and encouraged that type of stuff. And they wanted the fans to be so emotionally invested that when something like this happened and their hero, The Rock, got screwed over, they were ready to freaking riot because that's when you know, that's when you know that you've got real heat. That's when you know you've got the people and you've grabbed them by the asses of their seats. You've riveted them, you've enthralled them, and you've given them what they wanted, even when they absolutely hate you for it. God, this was such an awesome show to go back on a random Thursday night and watch for the first time in over 20 years. Last time I watched this show, I ordered it on pay-per-view. I was working two jobs at the time. It was the only time I had off during the week on a freaking Sunday. I was dead-ass tired. But damn it, it was Rock in a 60-minute Iron, Iron Man match against God? I didn't even have money back then, but I made sure that I ordered that pay-per-view. Oh, gr granted, another month, month and a half later, when the bills actually started coming through and they didn't get paid, and I had to switch uh, services from cable to satellite. You know, my tickets came home to roost back in 2000. Well, I was 19 years old. I had the world by the balls myself. Who the hell cared? But damn, this was such a fun, fun, fun trip down memory lane. And if you guys are looking for great things that involve Taker, just great WWF shows of the past, especially from the Monday Night Wars, the Attitude Era period, 
go check out Judgment Day 2000. I promise you it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. Just like it's worth it to check out all of the videos in the 30 Days of Taker video series. We're now 19 down. We've got 11 to go, folks. I've made it so far. And I plan on following all the way through. So thank you guys that have watched and supported this so far. Hopefully we've got some more good stuff still to come.